Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by loserpool.com. Head over there, sign up, enter for free for your chance to win £1,000. Now on this edition, we'll be reflecting on a gutless performance up at Goodison Park. I'll be discussing how the under-23s got on versus Derby County. I'm on my way in there now. My first experience covering Arsenal actually from the press box. So really looking forward to that. And I'll be sharing my thoughts on that game too a little bit later on. Now there's only one place to begin this week's show and that's at Goodison Park. It was Everton 1, Arsenal 0 and I've been asked numerous times since the game to describe the performance uh, in a few words and I guess the words that come to mind are toothless, gutless, embarrassing, Um, you know the list goes on and on and on and I'd hope that given the good run we'd been on of late, we'd go to Goodison Park, perform, boost our confidence away from home and, you know, you know, really put that behind us going into the home stretch, put that fear of going on our travels behind us and get on with it and push on and seal a place in the top four. But it seems as though that isn't going to happen and it's a real concern because when you look at things on paper, Arsenal are in the driving seat for a top four position, but... There is this worry now, isn't there, with these away games coming up that we can't do the business. And it seems to be a mental thing. Is it a mentality issue? Um, You know, we'll come on to the team selection and various other factors in a little bit. But for me, there is a fundamental problem at Arsenal when it comes to travelling away from home. And it's a problem that stretches back to not just last season, but the season before as well. If you remember, Arsenal were very, very poor away from home. Um, You know, last season, it was down to Arsene Wenger. Arsene Wenger ultimately lost his job as a result of it. And I'm not saying that Unai should lose his job because it hasn't improved that much. But Unai needs to take some responsibility for the fact that it's hardly improved this season as well. So, you know, lots lots to think about. Um, You know, like I said, this was a chance to put this away day hoodoo behind us and get on with things and push on and really make a statement in the hunt for the top four. But unfortunately, we didn't manage to do that. We've not kept a single clean sheet on our Premier League travels this season. For me, that's not that's not at all acceptable. We've got the third best home record in the league, but the 10th best away record. So why the stark contrast? I mean, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? We've scored 26 goals on the road and we've conceded 28. So what's the issue? I want to hear from you guys. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. It has to be mentality, doesn't it? It's certainly not down to a lack of ability. I've heard people say that there's a hangover there from Arsene Wenger, and I agree to an extent, but you can't keep saying that all our problems are a hangover from Arsene Wenger, but that all our positives this season are purely down to Unai Emery. You know, there's a bit of a, there is a crossover, isn't there? Inevitably, when a manager's at a club for so long, a new manager takes over, brings in some of his own players, but not enough to completely overhaul the squad. There is a crossover, isn't there? So let's be fair in our assessment of that. That's the only thing. Um, I would say, but you know, this away form, and I know I keep saying that I've said it God knows how many times already, but it needs to improve because if it doesn't, we're going to find ourselves missing out not only in the Premier League, but it could cost us on our travels in Europe as well, because our away form in that competition has also been poor. So, you know, lots to think about, lots for Unai Emery and his team to sit down and and worry about and and work on in the coming weeks, of course. Now, let's start with the team selection. Um, We started off with a central midfield pairing of Mohamed Elneny and Matteo Genduzzi. For me, that was a mistake. Um, If Aaron Ramsey was fit enough to feature, he should have started, in my opinion. You can rest him on Thursday when Lucas Torreira's back. Surely that would have made more sense. I think we're kind of in a a bit of a catch-22 as Arsenal Football Club at the moment because whereas last season, by this point, we were out of the top four race, it was easy for Arsene Wenger to say... I'm going for the the Europa League. Whereas now we're in the mix for the top four and we're still in the Europa League. And Unai has got a bit of a problem. Which way does he pull? Does he prioritise one over the other? Does he try and go for broke in both and risk messing one of them or even both of them up? It's it's really difficult, isn't it? And, And for that... I have sympathy for the boss. I really do. But going back to the team, Elneny Guendouzi, I think before the game I tweeted 
that my concern looking at that team was a lack of quality in the midfield. I called it before the game. I was very, very concerned about that. As good as Matteo Genduzzi is for a young player, he is exactly that. He's a young player still finding his way in the game. And for me, he should not be relied on as often as he has this season. And I've said it over and over again, and I'm going to keep on beating that drum. I know we had some injury problems, some suspensions this week in particular, but just kind of highlighted, didn't it, that Matteo Guendouzi isn't ready, in my opinion, to play uh, in that midfield every week. And Mohamed Elneny, as good as a squad player he is, you don't want to be turning to him. I thought he was poor as well. Um, and I thought as a pair, they were just an absolute disaster. Then, of course, Unai Emery opted to start Henrik Mkhitaryan and Mesa Ozil. Can you afford to do that away from home? Can you afford to play both of them? Not for me. Alex Iwobi needed to be in that team. He's a ball carrier. He would have relieved us from certain pressure situations by bringing the ball up the pitch. He works extremely hard. I'm not saying that Mkhitaryan doesn't, but Mkhitaryan had an absolute stinker yesterday. And Iwobi, for me, just gives us something that the other two don't. So, for me, he should have been in the team. And, you know... I think maybe the thinking behind it from Unai Emery's perspective was I need some ball players in there because I don't have ball players in the middle of the park. Um, but I think overall it backfired. So, you know, again, a little bit of sympathy for the boss. I understand why he maybe went the way he did and I kind of get why he didn't want to start Aaron Ramsey and he probably thought that he had enough on the pitch. But in hindsight, it appears to have been a mistake. Now, Socrates um, as centre-back, he had to start, didn't he? Um, even with the risk of him picking up a two-match ban. I think he's been our best central defender this season. And I think many questions would have been raised had Unai left him out and we suffered defeat. So, again, sympathy for Unai. But it was silly from Socrates to get himself booked. There was no need uh, to make that challenge. And, you know, I, I guess we've kind of seen over the last few weeks that... You know, Lauren Koscielny, I know people spoke about him being finished, and I was one of those people, but he's still got a lot to offer to this team, a lot more than some of the other centre-backs at the club. But funny enough, um, I want to give Shkodran Mustafi some praise for once, because I thought he was probably our best defender on the day. And I don't often say that, and, you know, maybe we're a little bit too harsh on him at times, and everybody seems to want to get on his back at every opportunity. But for me, Shkodran Mustafi was Arsenal's best defender on the day. Let me know if you agree with that. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. As for the game itself, Arsenal, quite frankly, were never in control. Our possession was meaningless. We were unable to penetrate Everton's defence. But what I will say was we had a great shot for a penalty uh, early on for a foul on Alexander Lacazette. Kurt Zuma sliding across recklessly, made no contact with the ball. And it was a very late challenge. And I think perhaps the only reason that he's got away with that is because after Lacazette sort of scuffed his shot across the goal, Mesut Ozil was able to get onto the ball. And I think maybe that put the referee off giving it. And I think it's wrong, but, you know, that happens so often, I think. When players get taken out after the shot, it doesn't always get, or pass, I should say, or whatever that was, I'm not sure. It, it doesn't get punished as it should. So, real shout for a penalty there. And, and I was very disappointed that we didn't get that. And, you know, if we do get that and you score that, then it could be a very different game. Doesn't excuse our performance overall, but certainly a key moment in the game and one that's worth discussing. Um, I thought Mkhitaryan was, was poor, as I've already said. I thought that as a result of our midfield being so poor, Mesut Ozil was forced to drop deeper to try and get the ball. And that's not an excuse for him because he was poor as well. But he wasn't any worse than anybody else. Um, and, and, you know, there's people out there questioning why he was the captain and, you know, why he played the way he did and that he didn't motivate uh, the rest of the team, etc., etc. But nobody's questioning the man that makes him the captain. The man that's given him the armband is Unai Emery. And why? If Mesut Ozil is so unfit for that position, why does he keep getting the armband? And I know that other players and other candidates and some of Unai's other five captains are out of the running at the moment through injury, suspension, etc. For me, you can't sit there and question... Mesut Ozil as a captain, but then not look at the man who's given him that captain's band 
all the time at every opportunity whenever the others are not available Mesut Ozil is given it you know it could have been given to Socrates it could have been given to Nacho Monreal there are other candidates in there that could have had it but Ozil had it so you know Whilst I'm not excusing his performance, I didn't think it was great. I thought he was kind of hung out to dry um, this weekend. I, I don't like him operating from the right-hand side, which he was clearly asked to do uh, at Everton. So, you know, Ozil, not good enough. The performance was below par. Of course it was. But also there are other factors playing into that. And once again, Mesut Ozil is being made the scapegoat, in my opinion, for a poor team selection and a poor setup overall. But, you know, I'm not surprised to hear some of the hypocritical views that I have uh, in the aftermath of that game. There, there are lots of them flying around social media. Um, and, and here are just a few so you guys can get a feel of what I'm talking about. There are people saying, Mohamed on any shit shouldn't be in the team. But Granit Xhaka wasn't missed. There are people telling me that Unai Emery's turned this ship completely around. But our god awful away form is still Arsene Wenger's fault. There are people telling me that Mesut Ozil is crap and isn't fit to wear the Arsenal shirt, but it's okay for the boss to give him the armband. Now, this is the kind of hypocritical, you know, agenda that we have in our fan base at the moment, and it really winds me up. And to be quite frank, I'm sick of it, and I must have muted 50 people on Twitter yesterday just because I cannot be bothered to read the same shit over and over and over again. It's really, really frustrating. Ultimately... You know, the team selection played a part, but for me, the real problem at Goodison Park was a lack of desire, a lack of fight, a lack of passion. And it's really frustrating when you're playing a side who are essentially battling for seventh or eighth position and they want it more than you. They want it more than a team in the running for the Champions League. And that is really, really frustrating. I can't get my head around it. Um, I think... If you look at the season as a whole, I think at times we've been a little bit guilty of a negative approach uh, on the road. So, um, you know, that is a little bit frustrating too. I understand that we're defensively fragile and Unai wants to compensate for that in other ways. But we're Arsenal Football Club. We should be going out and playing teams off the park. We shouldn't be going uh, to certain teams and, and setting up like a Crystal Palace with all due respect to them. You know, it's, it's just frustrating. It winds me up. It's not the Arsenal way. And, you know, I, I, on the one hand, I understand why he takes that approach. But on the other, I just think if you can't defend and we've proven that we can't defend throughout the season. We've proven that even when we do set up in that way, we're incapable of getting a result most of the time. So why not play to your strengths, play a Bamiyang, play Lacazette and give it a real go? Um, I've already touched on Socrates picking up that booking that will see him now miss two league games, I think against Watford and Crystal Palace. Really frustrating that. But like I said already, I don't think the manager had any choice but to play him with Lauren Koscielny missing. And Socrates is that type of player, isn't he? That he always plays on the tightrope of of getting booked. He's a, you know, not very well disciplined and, and it's part of his game. And I guess if you take that away from him, then he's not the same player. So it was always going to happen. It was inevitable for me. Um, not too fussed about him missing the um, Crystal Palace game, but I think we could really do with him at Watford, particularly with Troy Deeney putting himself about the way he does. I think Socrates was probably our only defender equipped to handle that type of player. So that's a big blow. Um, but again, going back to the overall performance, it just wasn't good enough. Everton could have had more. Um, you know, only Leno probably came out of that game with any pride, with any credit. As I've already said Mustafi, probably our best defender. Um, and that is saying something, isn't it? But up to now, it's 19 points on the road. Fewer than Wolves, Palace, Leicester and Watford. And with some dodgy trips away still remaining, um, you know, Many of them being away to those teams I just mentioned. Watford, Leicester, Wolves, Burnley are our remaining away fixtures. It's no wonder uh, that people are concerned regarding the running. And we're angry, disappointed, sad over an opportunity missed. But we've got to pick ourselves up and go at Napoli on Thursday with everything we have. Because... I'm not confident regarding the second leg in Naples. Um, I think that will be a very, very uh, dodgy trip, um, a very difficult game. We know the atmosphere in the San Paolo is going to be unbelievable. So we need to do the business at the Emirates. I, I truly believe that. Um, 
just a couple of statistics finally from the game. You know, Arsenal 57% possession, but could only muster seven shots. Whereas Everton had 43 possession and managed to get 23 shots off on goal. Now, you know, that is, for me, telling of the way we play at the moment, of how negative um, we are at times and how we might have lots of possession, but we don't seem to be able to penetrate. We don't seem to be able to build up any sort of uh, creative play or anything like that. It just seems so, so boring and so, what's the word? It's like we've run out of ideas at times. You know, we have plenty of possession, but the stats say, oh, don't they? Seven shots to Everton's 23. And we had more possession. Read of that what you will. I also put a poll out today, actually, uh, regarding another incident that took place in the game after Mesut Ozil was substituted. He appeared to throw his jacket um, towards the direction of, of Marco Silva and Unai Emery, who were involved in a little bit of a heated confrontation. So we put a poll out today, a little bit of fun, uh, to try and lighten the mood. And and the question was, who was Mesut Ozil trying to throw his jacket at yesterday? Um 50% of you say Marco Silva, 41% say nobody. It was just an act of frustration. But there are some uh, interesting comments as well for those of you who voted other. So I'm just going to touch on a few of those. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Neil Will 72 on Twitter. She says, until he tells us, nobody knows. That's absolutely right. Uh, but like I said, we're just having a little bit of fun with this one. Um, I saw at ASU. WRR on Twitter says, I'm commenting to say if anyone thinks it was at Unai, they need to have their head checked. Um, Harry Nikolidakis says, I mess it in all the way, but that is just bullshit. I would not start him in Napoli all the weekend. Unai Emery has to show the room this is not acceptable. He was awful yesterday. Benjamin Dunn's having a little bit of a joke here. He says, Theresa May, um, Mark Guna underscore G-A-W-A says, he was probably pissed off knowing he'd been made the scapegoat again, despite subpar performances from the rest of the side. Uh, Moses Lewis says, I feel it was towards the fourth official. The referee was horrendous. He was giving everything against us and gave soft fouls. I feel Ozzy was frustrated at the referees. Robert says, Stan Kroenke. And there's plenty more here um so check it out it's on my personal twitter page at harry simu uh, with a capital h and a capital s check that out uh, for more gonna take a short break that's enough on that uh, damaging and uh, disappointing defeat up at goodison park when we return i'll be touching on the under 23s uh, currently as i said in the beginning on my way there now up to borenwood uh, to watch them i'll be in the press box reporting on that so really looking forward to that and uh i'm gonna put a pause in it now and uh, i'll record the second part of this podcast on my way home actually uh for you guys to find out how the young guns got on hopefully it's more positive than uh, what we saw uh just on sunday enjoying what you've heard so far if so make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on itunes i'm martin tyler and you're listening to harry Simeon. Welcome back to part two of this week's edition of the Chronicles of Aguna. And uh, I'm recording this segment on my way home from uh, Meadow Park, where Arsenal under 23s took on Derby County. And I was, uh, had well, I had the pleasure of being in the press box for this one. Um, so really, really enjoyed that. And of course, enjoyed the performance. Arsenal 5, Derby County nil in the end. Uh, a brace from John Jules, a goal from Willock, uh, Amaichi, and of course, Zek Medley uh, popped up with a towering header uh, just over 10 minutes from time. So a really convincing performance from Arsenal and there were some, uh, you know, really good individual performances as well as the collective one. Um, I thought Ballard at centre-back had a really, really good game, made a fantastic clearance off the line in the second half and I'll be honest, I don't watch a great deal of the under 23s but I'm being told by lots of you on social media that this is not the first time he's pulled off a fantastic goal line clearance so credit to him. Um, I thought John Jules looked formidable up front, really powerful striker, um, very ruthless in front of goal 
having said that he probably should have bagged the hat trick because he did have a chance in the first half uh, towards the end where he was put through on goal brilliantly by Joe Willock where he could have rounded off that hat trick all inside 45 minutes but unfortunately for him the keeper came out and made a very very good save um, I thought Javier Amaichi was very very effective uh, on Arsenal's right wing very tricky player very skillful likes to cut inside on his left foot and I thought he was fantastic we know about Bukayo Saka we've seen him in the in, in the first team picture as well he is a player who for me has bags and bags of potential I thought he probably could have done a little bit more tonight but that doesn't mean he had a bad game um, I just thought that Amaichi slightly outshone him this evening um also, I want to talk about Joe Willock, um, and I know this guy um, has been in and around the first team a lot more than most of these players uh, that featured this evening, but for me, the difference in standard was very clear to see. He was very mature, very dominant in the middle of the park, and I think that Joe Willock, based on what I've seen this evening is above that level um, without meaning to sound disrespectful to the under 23s and to the Premier League too. Joe Willock for me is kind of one of those players that's in between uh, that level and the first team at the moment. So it'll be interesting to see how Unai manages him. And it makes you ask the question, doesn't it? Why wasn't he included at the weekend when we were so, so short on midfielders? So that's something to think about uh, perhaps. Obviously, Freddie Lundberg is in charge of the under-23s. He's a fantastic coach. You can see that uh, just by sitting behind him. You can see the way he interacts with his players, the way he cares, the way he's so passionate. Uh, and the great thing about going and watching the under-23s is you can hear every word. So it gives you some real insight into the communication between the players on the pitch and, of course, uh, into the communication between the bench and the players. So it's really, really interesting stuff. And I'm over the moon to tell you guys that I managed to grab a couple of minutes with Freddie Lundberg at the end of the game to get his thoughts on the performance. Here's what he had to say. Freddie, a dominant display from the lads this evening. You must be thrilled with the, the way this team is developing. Your thoughts on the win? No, I'm... Over the moon for the boys. Um, they trained really well this week, and uh, I said it's totally up to them what they want to do when they come on the pitch and they uh, the show they wanted it and play some fantastic football. Moved the ball so well, thought we couldn't get close to them and kept the ball and then almost rolled the ball into the net in some occasions. So as as a coach, you. Uh, you get so happy. It's uh, one of those pleasing moments. I mean, for me watching, this is the first time I've come to watch the under-23s and I could see how much you were enjoying it and how into it you were. And it, it's great to have somebody who's been there and done it for, to help these young players through. Do you think, um, is this something that you, you love doing? You could, I mean, you could tell from, from in the stands how much you love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I do uh, love I do love it with a passion. And... Um, seeing players in their eyes when they understand the concept of certain things and not being funny certain things they did today is, is very difficult and whatever level you're at and uh, they're doing it with, with ease and, and scoring goals they did or creating chances they did like I mean it started from the goalkeeper and, and start, ended up almost in the back of the net so it just for me that's the pleasure like when you see in a young players either you teach them something help them something in their career it's a uh, it yeah, makes your uh, heart very uh, very warm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, who in particular stood out to you this evening? There was great performances all over the pitch, but who really stood out to you? No, I like, like not to or try not to um, speak about individual players. There's so many good players here and there's so much pressure on them regardless uh, to make it. Uh, so I try to stay with uh, as a team performance, but of course there are star performances um, that done really well, but... Uh, Today, I'll uh, just to glorify the team. Great, great stuff. Freddie, thank you so okay. much. Really thank appreciate you very much. It, appreciate it. All thank the best. You very much. That brings us to the end of another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Huge thank you to our sponsors, of course, loserpool.com. You can play last man standing with them. Visit their website for your opportunity to win £1,000 in cash. Uh, yeah, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to leave us a review. That's really, really important. And don't forget to enter our competition. All you need to do is head over to our Twitter page at uh, Chronicles underscore AFC. Like the tweet 
retweet it and follow um, those who have donated this wonderful prize, the 12th men. Uh, make sure you do that. You know, not many of you have taken it up and I'm not sure why. It's free to enter your opportunity to win a singing Arsenal scarf. Apologies, uh, just lastly, for the dip in the sound quality, of course. As I mentioned, I am recording this podcast on the move. Haven't been able to get into the studio, but we've got plenty more content coming your way this week and that will be recorded in the studio so if it's been a little harsh on your ears i do apologize but who cares we got freddie lundberg on that's what matters until next time take care